ChatGPT unlocking the potential of AI in higher education. As a late career academic, transitioning from entrepreneur to lecturer, addressing educational drift is what derives purpose in my role here at the business school. Seeking utility and relevance in what we teach and research has always been a passion. Educational Drift um, is a research paper that I've basically been working on at the moment. Um, and it, it's looking at these kind of three, three areas. It, it's adapted actually from this textbook here, Exploring Strategy, uh, the concept of strategic drift, uh, Johnson and Scholes. And basically what we've got here is this line representing organisational change. This line at the top here representing environmental change. And then this is this is what they've called strategic drift, the gap between the organisation and the operating environment. Famous example from the Harvard MBA is um, Kodak uh, failing to keep pace with the environment. What I've done is I've expanded this model to include education. And you can see education lagging, uh, you know, organisation will change, lagging environmental change. Then I've defined this gap here as the utility gap uh, and the gap between uh, educational change and the environmental change is the relevance gap. So a lot of strategy, which is my uh, specialist field, um, is based around analysing the environment and looking how organisations can uh, adopt suitable strategies uh, to, to said environment. And hence, I've always been very interested in looking at what's going on here, using tools like PESL to analyse the political, economic, social, technological, environment, legal changes. Um, in particular, I've always been a bit interested in technology. I've liked seeing what's going on with kind of Elon Musk, a lot of action with SpaceX, reusable rockets and Starship, Tesla and electric vehicles coming uh, coming forward. And I've followed uh, quite a lot of the, the different technological companies. And that is where I first came across AI and uh, chat B, chat GPT. And Basically, come December 2022, boom, this sort of started a little mini explosion in the sort of echo chamber, shall we say, of people who are who are following this sort of stuff like myself, which brings us to the session uh, as we are discussing today. So. Um, what are we going to talk about in this session? We are going to talk about OpenAI, a little bit of history, Sam Altman, who he is, the CEO. We're going to have an explore of ChatGPT, GPT-4, Bing. We're going to have a look at Cody, Novo AI, research buddy, some apps built on the ChatGPT-4 route. We're going to ask the question, how does all this work under the hood? We're going to have a look at the wider implications for higher education, uh, teaching, learning, assessment, curriculum ethics. Uh, we're going to explore the wider implications for business and society. And we're going to finish by saying, you know, what is next for uh, Manchester Metropolitan University Business School? And also what's next for, for, for you, for you, the academic, for you, the MMU staff, uh, for you in professional services. What, where do we go after this presentation? What do we do next with AI? So, OpenAI, where did they come from? What have they been doing? What next? OpenAI was formed in 2015 as a nonprofit. Sam Altman, uh, the current CEO, uh, Elon Musk, Greg Brockman, the president, Uri uh, Hoffman, Jessica Livingston, Peter Thiel of PayPal fame, various other parties, uh, Y Combinator, uh, Research, the, the, the Silicon Valley um, 
startup uh, incubator people, all between them pledged uh, one billion to this uh, venture. And very much AI's founders, they structured it as a nonprofit. The idea very much being that they would be gifting, as it were, pr pr uh, AI to the world, that the benefits uh, and the wealth associated um, with um, AI. And they very much had the mission to actually achieve artificial general intelligence. What is our AGI, artificial general intelligence, as opposed to AI, I hear you ask? Well, AGI is when artificial intelligence reaches the point where it is uh, comparable slash surpassing uh, our own level uh, as human beings. Um, rather interestingly, this chap, Ray Kurzweil, in his book, The Singularity is Near, predicted this moment when an AGI would arrive as being 2028. I think he did this, this was published back in 1999, something like that. I can't quite remember what the date is, but um, it's been reviewed and ridiculed over the years a little bit. Um, but this moment where the AGI uh, you know, is created and that artificial intelligence reaches the level of humans um, is called the singularity. And then the idea after the singularity, you end up with AIs making other AIs, and then that AI designs an AI to make another AI, and we end up with this crazy superintelligence, and all all sorts of wonderful things happen, like uh, you know, who knows? Hopefully not the Skynet Terminator Two scenario, um, but we shall uh, we shall see. Hopefully a nice friendly uh, super AI. Anyway, this was the mission of OpenAI to create an AGI, uh, to move us forwards to create this AGI, but to have it owned as a non-profit for the benefit of, of humanity. Now in 2018, Elon Musk uh, resigned from the company due to potential conflicts with Tesla AI and SpaceX. We don't know too much exactly why, uh, but you know we, this was discovered later on. And in 2019, uh, rather quickly after Elon Musk resigning, uh, it transitioned to a for-profit company. Now, profit. Now they've got an interesting structure. Uh, OpenAI. They've set themselves up as you know the still original non-profit. You know exists at this level, and the non-profit wholly owns the for-profit company. Now the for-profit co company, all investors in that their investments are capped to a hundred times multiple return. Uh, and we, you know, we now know this Microsoft Azure have in, invested, all the, uh, the staff and employees have got share options and various other people, et cetera. Et cetera. And, and the idea for doing that uh, was that OpenAI wanted to attract lots of much larger quantities of investment, but also retain their kind of key staff and talent by allowing them to share in the in the benefits and the and the wealth created uh, from 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 their research, and that's um, that's kind of what happened here. However, at such a time as everybody has made one hundred times uh, any investment, the idea is that the the AGI uh, that's been created would be returned to humanity to benefit us all uh, and be owned the you know uh, the non profit. You know, a little bit like the National Trust, think of maybe like the national, such the international uh, AGI that is is gifted to to us all. So this was the transition to for profit, but it's got quite an interesting structure. It's limited for profit. Now in 2020, GPT three launched. Um, in 2021, Dali launched. Dali uh, is an image, a text to image generating AI that OpenAI have been working on. And in 2022, December, things went crazy. Really, this is when ChatGPT launched. Now, ChatGPT was uh, based on uh, GPT 3.5. So there's nothing particularly new uh, about the actual AI and the responses and the, and the engine underneath it. What was new was that ChatGPT was this uh, easily accessible user interface 
that was basically free to use that, that they published directly on the web. And suddenly, normal people, non outside the tech world, could access ChatGPT and start communicating it. And it had 1 million signups in the first five days, 100 million users in the first two months. And we, we, we can kind of see over here uh, it is the fastest growing website slash app in his, history, reaching those 100 million users within the first two months. Uh, Netflix took nearly Netflix took nearly uh, 10 years to achieve that. I think Instagram was the current previous leader, taking sort of two, just over two years to reach the 100 million uh, milestone. Now, Sam Altman actually describes this moment, the launch of ChatGPT, as the moment that history will most likely remember. And I, re I read an interesting uh, article in The Guardian uh, over the weekend, and there was a chap referring in there as, you know, tech space, as in the world where all the computer people are and the technical people and the coders are, and they're all talking, communicating about things. And then he described rather crudely and, and offensively, I, I think, that the rest of the world as meat space. Uh, the non-tech people, people, the non-coders, uh, the likes of us in the business school, uh, um, le 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 uh, lecturers and uh, like myself, and all of us non-coders and non-technical people. And really, we can think of this launch of ChatGPT as being a transition of, you know, amazement about AI was already in existence in the in the tech world. And when ChatGPT launched, it transitioned into meat space, as as uh, they refer to in the Guardian article. And suddenly, everybody is using it. You know, children, young people, students, business people, etc. And things just took off. And I think Sam Altman cites this perhaps as the historical moment because you know it's certainly going to be the one where where impact and memory is formed. Now, since ChatGPT launched, the world changed and things have severely accelerated. We've had the 2020, 23rd of January, Microsoft invested 10, million, 10 billion pounds in OpenAI, valuing it at 40 billion. I suspect that value is going up already. Satya Nadella, the CEO of Microsoft, uh, announced that we'd be in, they would be incorporating AI tools like ChatGPT into, into Word and Microsoft products and Microsoft Office, um, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Teams Premium incorporating GPT 3.55 was launched. Um, sadly, the educational version doesn't have the AI features integrated at this time, but, but Premium does, it's out there. Google Bard launched, which was Google's response with their own AI machine. ChatGPT on the 1st of Feb launched its subscription model. And for those people who actually subscribe to it, you can actually get on it and access ChatGPT. Uh, and it is uh, quite, um, well, it's much more stable and much more usable. I use it every day. Uh, and it's it's very very reliable. The free model is, I'm afraid, all over the place because it literally has hundreds of millions of people all clamoring uh, to get on it. Possibly even more now. Amazon tied up with Hugging Face. Hugging Face are an uh, open source um, AI. Facebook Meta Launch Llama. So we've now got all of the the big four tech firms: Google, Facebook, and Amazon all now in the AI space. Meta very much pivoting from the metaverse uh, policy and, and, and getting into AI. I saw this really interesting report about um, there was a correlation in Facebook's uh, share price due to how many times they mentioned the words AI in, the, uh, in their quarterly results and how many times they were, uh, mentioned Meta. And if they didn't men and then the last one, they didn't mention Meta at all. They mentioned AI like 20 times and the shares, the shares bounced back. Um, 1st of March, ChatGPT launches. Uh, sorry, ChatGPT and Whisper APIs launch. What's an API? Uh, 
basically it's ways uh, other programs and software uh, and apps on phones can call um, Whisper, which is um, a chat GPT based translation um, and, and chat GPT it models itself. So, so other applications and software developers can build on top of them. We look at some of those to, today. 14th of March, GPT-4 launched. We've got Microsoft 365 Copilot. We've got ChatGPT plugins. We'll talk about what they are later. Zapier launch puddings, Research Buddy uh, la uh, launched uh, yesterday. And there's just a whole host of uh, things coming. In fact, the GPT-4 API has just launched here. So every single model that we see that currently is using the GPT-3.5 is very soon going to be updated to uh, GPT-4. Now, Sam Altman, the CEO of OpenAI, let's have a listen to what he's got to say here. We have been a misunderstood and badly mocked org for a long time. Like when we started, we like announced the org at the end of 2015 and said we were going to work on AGI. Like people thought we were batshit insane. Yeah. You know, like I, I, <laughs> I remember at the time a eminent AI scientist at a large industrial AI lab was like DMing individual reporters being like, you know, these people aren't very good and it's ridiculous to talk about AGI and I can't believe you're giving them time of day. And it's like, that was the level of like pettiness and rancor in the field at a new group of people saying, we're going to try to build AGI. So OpenAI and DeepMind was a small collection of folks who were brave enough to talk about AGI um, in the face of mockery. We don't get mocked as much now. Now, Sam Altman has we've seen there, uh, wanted to get this company going, wanted to build the AGI, this team of people. They all wanted to create the singularity. People thought they were crazy. Not so much today. Moved, mo moved it forward. Really wanted to sort of develop AI. Well, this is a podcast, by the way. Uh, episode 367, Lex Friedman. It just dropped a couple of days ago. Highly recommend watching it. It's three hours long. Fascinating insight into what uh, Sam Altman's view is for the development of AI. And really, very much of the nature of the lean startup, i.e., rapid innovation, testing, getting these products, rolling them out there. So it's all minimum viable product. They get ChatGPT3 out, they roll it out, they share it, they share it, they get user feedback, they get G3.5 out, roll it, share it, user feedback, GPT4. And there's a whole stream of features uh, coming uh, forward that, that Altman is really driving, this kind of developmental dialogue. Now, there's a strategic tension very much between Elon Musk and Sam Altman. In terms of AI innovation, Elon Musk feels we need to take it slow. We need to be very careful because the dangers of AI uh, getting out of control, self-replicating the kind of Skynet Terminator, Skynet Terminator 2 uh, scenario are, are, are very real and very dangerous indeed. He feels we should be taking things very slowly, testing things in very controlled environments and really holding back on the rate of development. Altman, uh, on the other hand, is straight out of the Lean Startup playbook. It's get the product out there, test it, validated learning through interaction with um, members of the public, and really have a kind of a dynamic relationship of differing versions getting better. And as A is a, AI is approaching AGI and the singularity, IA breaker as well, there's a kind of a dialogue going on and humanity and, and society are learning about AI and how to deal with it and how to set it up as it's being developed, as it's being um, created. And this kind of um, symbiotic relationship will will, will affect, it's, it's called the, the, the alignment problem, aligning the goals of the AI with, 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 human with the human race, with them being co-developed. They, they really don't get on about it. 
uh, there's a lot of banter on Twitter and uh, Elon Musk's a little bit of a jerk on, on, on Twitter, as usual, moaning and mumbling. Uh, and Sam Altman uh, you know, tends to sort of keep his head down a little bit, uh, but just uh, keep putting his uh, piece out there. But um, it's just quite interesting to, to consider this from a strategic tension point of view. So let's have an explore of these applications. OK, so. If you guys want to uh, join uh, OpenAI, you just need to type in uh, OpenAI, go to the website. And if you nose around here, you should be able to find a uh, try chat GPT. There we go. That's the one you want to go to. You then need to sign up for a free account that will bring you to a screen like this. I've actually signed up so I can pull Ch chat GPT 3.5 and GPT 4. Um, you need to uh, click to be able to uh, go on uh, with that as well. So let's have a look uh, at some of the um, some of the some of the prompts.
Okay, so so we've seen the vanilla chat GPT uh, with GPT-4. So this is the, the basic AI model uh, where we're accessing it directly. But the second wave of AI innovation is going to come in, well, uh, Arnid Naravarian has uh, you know, defined this into two areas, putting the AI, i.e. the chat GPT technology, could be other models, but we're, we're just focusing on chat GPT here, putting the AI into applications, i.e. software packages, uh, web pages, etc. Putting the AI into applications versus putting applications into the AI, i.e. building plugins, etc. into the, the, the chat GPT uh, user interface um, slash website uh, itself. So let's explore this a little. Microsoft, who've just recently invested 10 billion uh, into OpenAI, they're very much at the moment showing their hand in terms of putting AI into applications. Uh, we're going to shortly have a look at Bing, how they've integrated it into the search engine, and they've also uh, expanded this to include uh, Microsoft Office 365 Copilot. So we're going to be well, it's 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 just about available now. Uh, we're seeing uh, ChatGPT supported uh, tools in Word, um, Excel, uh, PowerPoint, uh, the Teams professional version uh, will produce meeting notes, distribute it. They're building AI into a whole suites of their products and ranges of their products. We're just going to have a look at Bing today. So let's see what Bing can do. Microsoft aren't the only people putting AI into applications. Um, OpenAI have made their API, and API is basically a, a programming interface, uh, an application programming interface that just allows any developer, any website maker, any computer software programmer to call the power of ChatGPT, i.e., they can send a request that gives the prompt to the AI and takes the response and brings it back. And then they can use that within any applications that they build on top. So we've got a whole suite of applications 
here that have been developed. Um, this link here, uh, Futurepedia AI, is absolutely, uh, it's a fantastic uh, database uh, of all the things, that have, you know, of most of the things that are being developed at the moment. Let's have a look at that. So we can see here, there are 1,478 AI tools in 50 categories in this database, five already added today, etc., uh, etc. Et uh, and we've got, uh, what's quite nice about this site as well is that they're ranked, uh, you can see how many times people have bookmarked, it, bookmarked them, we've got up, Upwards, some Reese Faster with Upwards AI tools, Box AI, Piggy Magic, uh, Magic Form 328, train AI, an AI salesperson to boost conversions in 20% in three minutes. We've got the ChatGPT website builder, AI website builder, including copy, even images in 30 seconds, um, whole range of uh, mid journey. Uh, this is uh, a lab exploring new mediums to expand human imagination. So this is, uh, you know, one of the image generating ones, Jasper. A uh, whole range of differing ones. There's the uh, the vanilla chat BPT, but there are literally thousands of apps here. And this is telling us whether they're free, whether they're paid, and we can do searches, we can do filters, we can look at tools that are tools added today. So 11 more tools added just today. <laughs> we can put them into coding assistance, copywriting, audio editing, <coughs> excuse me, educational assistance. Check if text is AI generated. An absolutely incredible plethora that grows day by day. OK, so. Let's have a look at some of the, these tools ourselves.
So we've seen putting AI into the applications. Now let's have a look at what happens when you put applications in to the AI. And basically what we've got here is chat GPT plugins. Uh, I'll let OpenAI explain these ones. Today I'm going to show you how you can use ChatGPT to do some simple meal planning. First, let's head to the plugin store to install the necessary plugins. Next, let's ask ChatGPT for a restaurant recommendation on Saturday, a recipe for Sunday, the total calorie count, and to order the ingredients on Instacart. First, it's using OpenTable to find me a great restaurant for Saturday. For Sunday, it's finding me a simple recipe and it's asking Wolfram Alpha to calculate the calories. 862, great. Now let's make the shopping list. All right, all we have to do to order the ingredients is click the link. ChatGPT with browsing allows the model to research real-time information beyond its training data. Let's see how ChatGPT with browsing can help us catch up on current events. ChatGPT with browsing uses the Bing API to search, and it uses a text-based web browser to go beyond just search results to actually navigate websites. It can synthesize information found across multiple sources to give us a more grounded response. Using its research from browsing, ChatGPT has given us an answer here with two citations. We can hover over each of the citations to see where it's sourced from, and we can even click the citation to go directly to the source and verify the claims that ChatGPT has made here. ChatGPT with browsing is calibrated to browse only when needed. In this query, ChatGPT already knows the answer and it correctly chooses not to browse. Okay, so how does all of this work? What's going on under the hood? How are these apps, how is ChatGPT coming up with this information? Well, ChatGPT is a large language model, LLM, with natural language processing capabilities, NLP. It basically completes the sequence. You input a prompt, it completes the sequence. So, for your birthday, I baked you a cake. It's quite an easy prompt guess to predict. Um, for your uh, strategic management uh, uh, business assignment, you will need to write a 3000 word essay critiquing Netflix's transition to online streaming. And then it would write a 3000 word essay etc. And this, this prompting and generative AI that is going on, that is what is happening. It is trying to com come up with the next most likely thing. Complete the, se the sentence. What does GPT stand for? It stands for Generatively Pre-Trained Transformer. And this is all coming from this paper that was published back in 2017. Uh, Called attention is all you need. Uh, this video, the video uh, uh, link I put at the bottom presentation here. Andrew Karapathy, uh, the the lead, um, the, pre the previous head of AI at, at Tesla, self driving, who now works for OpenAI, gives a fantastic explanation of this and goes through it all. All we really need to know is that this transformer kind of uh, me methodology, the transformer model, has been used to train all kinds of uh, large language models. It's been very robust and it's really up the quality of some of the outputs that we're seeing. Uh, what, 
what's going on here? Well, it, you know, it's using a neural network. Um, you know, a silicon version of the neural network. What is a neural network? A neural network is basically how the brain works. It's all the connections between the synapses. synapses. And when we want to think of what we're going to say next and complete the sentence, my neural network is generating the words that are coming out of my mouth. Uh, I'm not looking something up. I'm not remembering things. I'm not using memory. I'm using my neural network to be predicting things to move uh, forward within my brain. And basically, a transformer based trained AI model is doing the, exactly the same thing as that in silicon. It's a whole um, series of dials that are, are connecting things together. And that's where it comes from. Fundamentally, as well, ChatGPT is generative AI as opposed to. To retrieval AI. Now, retrieval AI is probably what we're all familiar with and have got an idea. It's, it's this idea of using an algorithm, a set of rules, a set of filters to go away and look up and find information. So, you know, search engines are doing this. Uh, basically, Google is crawling the whole web, finding a, all sort of little links and references of keywords. You put a prompt in, from that prompt, it uses the Google algorithm, the little set of rules. It goes away and looks up the most appropriate responses and ranks them and brings them back for you to see. So this is retrieval AI. And most of the chatbots we've seen pre-2022, well, this is what they've been. Uh, those annoying customer service help things where you're, uh, can you help me with, uh, uh, I've got a problem with my computer, I can't turn it on and off. Uh, and then it goes, uh, um, oh, would you like uh, to go through to the sales department? Uh, no, no, I need to do this. Is it a technical problem? Have you tried this? That's retrieval based iron. So it's trying to guess from the words and match you to some information that it's got stored and look it up and, and bring it back. ChatGPT is not that. ChatGPT is generative AI. And generative AI is using a neural network inspired model to generate the response. So this is literally the same as how we are knowing what to, to say next. I'm not remember using my memory or looking things up to know what I'm going to say next. I'm using a neural, net a neural network within my brain to carry on speaking, and that is what ChatGPT is doing. So it, it is synthesizing the information and creating what is effectively new original content as generated by the AI. This is generative AI versus as opposed to retrieval AI, and it's a significant breakthrough. Uh, and it's very important to understand uh, the difference uh, in terms of what's going on here. So what's a large language model? Well, this gives you a bit of an idea. We take different forms of data, we train it, we create a foundation model, and then we can have all sorts of different kinds of outputs, question answering, uh, sentiment analysis, image captioning, object recognition, et cetera, et cetera. How would we make one? Well, roughly, we start with the transformer model. Um, that little diagram uh, underneath it, that's the, the little schematic of the transformer. I've had a little bit of a an attempt to read attention is all you need. And uh, I can't exactly say I fully understand it, but roughly, roughly what is going on is there's a few lines of code. If we think of it like a, like a, like a model that um, has billions of little dials and initially they're all set to zero. Uh, and there's a few lines of code with all of these dials, not, not very long, but there's, there's billions of these, the, these parameters, these little dials, and they're all set to zero. And then we start off with this base transformer model, this model with all of these dials. And then we take huge quantities of training data, ChatGPT, 200 billion iterations. And we put it in, so we take something like the complete works of Shakespeare and we'll go to, and it will have a go at guessing the next word. It actually does characters, but let's say so you're two and it goes like Norman. No, that was wrong. So it tries again. Uh, Jones, it discovers that 2B is, is, is quite a good guess. Uh, and then 2B, uh, what would the next word be? Uh, 2B, uh, and after a while it works out 2B or 2B or not to be, etc. Uh, so after these B 
billions of iterations. It's adjusting the parameters and looking at, given a sequence of work, what is most likely to come next. And when you get this into the range of billions, uh, you know, perhaps the big discovery was at the hundreds of millions level, uh, you know, it, it would sort of uh, be half good and spout a bit of gibberish. But at the billions of iterations of training, then suddenly it starts to literally write, write extremely convincing uh, sh sh Shakespeare. So we take this transformer model, all the stuff set at zero. We take all this training data. We go through billions of iterations, get all the dials adjusted. Um, so it can predict with confidence what needs what needs to come next. The next stage is reinforcement learning from human feedback or RLHF. Now we don't need, Sam Altman said, uh, you know, not as many cycles as you think are required here. So we're not talking billions of cycles of reinforcement learning from human feedback for training. He didn't specify our number, but I'm guessing somewhere in the thousands of cycles. So that we've now got humans looking at these different outputs uh, and responses and saying, oh, yes, that one's what I expected. That's one not what I expected. More like this, less like that, and so on and so forth. So we've got this reinforcement learning cycle. And then what we end up with is our AI model. So we started with our transfer with all the, all the dials set to zero with its billions of parameters. It goes through billions of sets of automatic training data. Then it has reinforced learning from human feedback. And all the time we're adjusting these dials, these dials, and eventually we come out with our AI model that's that's fully trained, our transformer-based AI model. And that now has all of these dials adjusted to, and it's ready uh, as a result of the training, and it's ready to start predicting and, and guessing the next word, slash words, slash essays, and so on and so forth. Doesn't have to be words uh, coming to that point because that training process works for not just language it works for for all sorts of different things and just down the right hand side here in the green we've got you know reinfer reinforcement lear learning models going on here so uh, i know microsoft has got one where they they, they put the, the the ai model inside a robot and it's learning about touch and moving and how to walk around the room without bumping into things and things we've got computer vision models the kind of things uh that are you know generating images or perhaps uh, you know Tesla AI using that aren't they to 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 to, to drive and, and nav navigate city streets and lots of advanced labeling you know spot spot the tanks in the trees spot the cancer cell in in, in this picture etc we've got speech recognition models uh, like like uh, whisper um, we've got anomaly detection models we've got recommendation models etc and then we have large language models. Uh, we're going to focus on large language models in this presentation. And I've covered the four uh, big ones there. We've got BARD, which is a Google's large language model. We've got Bloom, which is a, a, an open source uh, large language model produced by Hugging Face. They've just signed a, a deal with Amazon Warehouse to, to, to kind of work together. We've got Llama, uh, which is a 67 billion. So on the smaller side, large language model that that meta slash facebook uh, have have launched met meta recently pivoting to get much more into ai as opposed to the metaverse you know i think they've recognized where the action is here and then obviously down in the left hand corner we have you know microsoft with its teaming up with open ai but you know these are the open ai models gpt3 gpt3.5 and gpt4 with gpt4 being able to take 50 pages of prompting information uh, as it runs through uh, in order to generate that uh, pro that next answer. So you, you can upload it with 50 pages prompt and then it will try and work out what is to come next. So that's how we'd make an AI model. That's who's doing what that gets on with what's going on there. Now, what goes on under the hood of the transformer? If you have a look down the bottom here, Basically, it's converting uh, on a large language model, uh, you know, it's converting a, a sentence of words, the initial prompt to a sequence of numbers. And it is then using all of these dials that it's got to predict uh, numbers and carry on the, the number sequence. And then it converts it back into words. And hey, presto. Um, 
that's a severe oversimplification, but uh, that's all you really need to know. So it's not looking anything up. It is converting into this sequence and then it is carrying on the sequence. It's like two, four, six, eight is the input. The large language model goes oh, 10, 12, 14, 16. But make that billions of times more complicated and you get the idea. So some of the terminologies, we've got AI, artificial intelligence. We all kind of know what that one means. AGI, artificial general intelligence. This is AI at the level of human level artificial intelligence. And, you know, actually it probably already is there for, for you know, the average human. Uh, but let's go for, um, you know, we, we're talking, you know, superior to human uh, artificial general intelligence. In fact, the, the, the definition of artificial general intelligence is a little bit vague, uh, but one thing's for sure, when it's smarter than the smartest human, it, we will definitely have it. Uh, the singularity. The singularity is the point, as defined by this, uh, this Ray Kurzweil book. The singularity uh, uh, is the point at which we achieve uh, artificial uh, general intelligence. And then the idea is that all sorts of crazy things happen because the this AGI can uh, work to build a new AGI. And then the AGI that was made by the AGI, that we're onto sort of AGI 2, uh, that can then make its own, uh, de de design its own AGI and we're onto like AGI version 3. And now we're just into the realms of like, it becomes, crazy, impossible to, to conceive that and things shoot away. Large language model, we've covered that, LLM. The transformer, that's that little schematic. It's this sort of base model that is being trained on all the data, having all these dials adjusted. So the, the transformer and the large language model are, are basically the same, the same thing, really. The, the transformer is with all the dials set to zero, and at the end out pops a transformer-based large language model. Natural language processing, all that means is you can talk to it uh, in, in well any language. Uh, GPT, generatively pre-trained transformer. So that's the transformer model that has been pre-trained on a load of data. And it is now uh, ready to produce regenerative AI. So GPT, generatively pre-trained transformer, GPT-2, GPT-3.5, et cetera, an app. Well, that's just a software application. It could be an application on your phone. Uh, it could be a website. It could be um, something that runs on your PC. We've got API. Uh, this is application programming interface. This is how different computer programs uh, can talk to each other. So the data in, uh, let's say, um, uh, Zero, which is an accounting software, could output into a, a Google Sheet or a, a, an Excel spreadsheet online could uh, connect in with, with your email. And the way these uh, differing apps talk to each other, it, they are using the, a, an API. It's like a, a lock and key so you can you can share the data between them. Cloud computing simply means that the data is or the software is running uh, in the cloud, which is probably a bunker somewhere in Silicon Valley or the desert of Nevada or something, and we're accessing it via the internet, uh, be it we're accessing the data or be it that the, the program's running there, as opposed to it running locally on your own PC. And finally, we've got these generative AI models versus retrieval AI models. Retrieval AI models are what we're all familiar with, works like Google Search, it's all about looking, looking up, using a, you know, you, you input a prompt, um, fruits of the world, and uh, the, the, uh, the, the AI, the retrieval AI, is then looking at uh, like a little algorithm. It might have all of the web pages on the internet ranked via different keywords and things, and it'll be looking for the ones that mention fruit and world and, and lists and that sort of thing, and, you know, how much time people have spent on them, and it will go away and retrieve the most appropriate results from that you know, big data source. As opposed to a generative AI model, which would take fruits of the world, it would input it into its transformer-based uh, algorithm, uh, and sorry, not algorithm, uh, model. It would input it into that, 
and all of the little different dial settings that are, that are in there will cause it to generate a response that it feels is the most appropriate in completing the sequence. So it is taking all of that synthesized data into the string of numbers and generating a response. There's no looking up at all. Generative AI versus retrieval AI. But that's the, the big sort of mind, uh, the big paradigm shift in our thinking really of understanding, uh, you know, how we interact with, with, with computers. So what? So what does all this mean? Well, it means uh, chat GPT and large language models, they're working on this complete sentence basis. Uh, you, you transform the prompt into a series and predicts the one that comes next. We've covered that before. Chat GPT does not understand English. It has no common sense. There's no common sense filter. That said, it's effective common sense. It's quite possibly uh, higher than you know, a good significant portion of the population, I would say at least 50%. And this then gets us into an interesting question of, well, if it's effective common sense is better than 90% of the population or 95% of the population, starts to ask the question of, well, what is common sense? And does it really, does it, does it, does it really matter? If it's effectively the same, well, who are we to, to criticize it? It can give incorrect answers. It's only as good as, the data it was trained on, uh, at, you know, but you can train it yourself. You can tell it what's wrong. You can add uh, additional information in there. And there's, there's a whole really interesting field on training these AI models. And I, I know OpenAI in, in that uh, the Sam Altman, Lex, Lex Friedman uh, podcast really talks about a lot of the work they've done to get good quality, clean um, training data sets and adding different weights of importance to different types of things. Now, it can make things up. You know, this phenomenon is called hallucination. Uh, and from my, from my use, if I ask it questions where there's lots and lots of data around that I know it would have been trained on, it tends to produce very good quality synthesized responses. But if I ask it uh, information uh, on an area where there's a very small amount of information, it will just fill in the blanks and make something up. I mean, when uh, we were working on uh, developing the research uh, buddy dot, dot app uh, that, that, we, that we made, I would ask it about uh, you know, strategic management literature, of which there's 100,000 publications. There's lots to go out, and it's really good at finding the best ones and synthesizing them and, and, and bringing it all together. But I also asked it about rollerblading in Manchester. Uh, it said there wasn't much literature about that, but it did bring up a few things. And I was thinking, there's some interesting research papers there. Are they real research papers? I also asked it about sheep farming in the Peak District, and it brought some very suspicious looking studies of uh, sheep farming in the Peak District up. And, and it all sounded very plausible from a, a set of academic publications and research on sheep farming in the Peak District, but I didn't fully believe it. And for sure, some of these uh, references and responses and things that it's coming up, it, it's making them up. But I think that tends to happen when when it, it's lacking training data. So it, it just starts getting creative and, and, and has a go because it's generating the next most likely response. So, you know, if there's loads of data, you know, it's quite easy to predict, a, you know, a human like next response. If there's a tiny amount of data, then, you know, it's going to struggle. Um, one thing that I'm sure we're going to see in future versions is some sort of analysis of the scope of the data set relevant to the question um, prior to generating generating the output. Uh, that could be a way of dealing with these hallucinations. Perhaps you've got two AI models talking to each other in a little filter beforehand and where, where the, the you know, there isn't sort of data, it, you know, it, it, it might have a guess, but it lets you know it's having a guess. Where there's lots of data, it, you know, it can tell you it's very confident in what is going on. And finally, it can incorporate bias. Uh, it's only going to be as good as the data it's trained on, uh, but you can train it and you can trick it and you can, you can do all, all, all sorts of things. In general, if you scrape the entire internet, it probably is a little bit more left-leaning uh, politically than right right leaning uh, politically overall 
So, you know, there has been, you know, a few uh, uh, issues relating to that, and, and it, it's going to be quite quite a challenge to get it lined up. Uh, so it's as impartial and balanced as as possible. Is GPT-4 conscious? Now, this was uh, uh, quite an interesting uh, debate, really. Uh, not knowing a lot about the academic literature in consciousness, I quickly popped in, uh, you know, consciousness, uh, testing for consciousness into into the, re the research buddy app and, and GPT-4 and had a little bit of a look through the literature to see what there was. And what I what I discovered was there is a lot of debate about the definition of consciousness and we can't really specifically define what it is now. Furthermore, we don't know how to test for consciousness. There's various tests, but none of them are exclusively proven. Um, there's no consensus on how we can specifically define what consciousness is. Really, all we've got to go on is Descartes, I think, therefore I am. You know, I am thinking, therefore I know I'm conscious, but how do I know anyone else is conscious? And proving that is just exceptionally difficult. And we get to this scenario of if an AGI walks, thinks and acts like a human, how would we prove to it that we were conscious if it asked us? So there's our walking, talking AGI. It looks, it sounds, does everything that, 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 that we would imagine to be a human. And we go, yeah, but are you conscious? And he goes, no, I am conscious. Goes, well, prove it. And, it. and suddenly it turns around and goes, no, you, you prove to me that you're human. And if you think about that for a moment, how how would how would you prove that you're conscious? Um, challenging. Now, Ilya Sutskiver, uh, co-founder of OpenAI, he came up with uh, an idea of how to tackle this. Quite an interesting one. Uh, Sam Altman uh, talked about it in the Lex Friedman podcast. He came up with training a model like a, an AI model, but don't mention consciousness in any of the training data. So it's not mentioned at all. Then once the model is up and running, you could describe consciousness and it might just learn it normally. Or if it said something like, oh, I know what you're talking about. Uh, I feel just like that. So that would potentially be quite a good way to test for consciousness. So don't explain the concept of it, don't tell it at all. But if it is experiencing that phenomena, once you explain it, it might recognize uh, that, you know, what consciousness is from its own experiences. So. We're getting into some you know crazy space here. Now, I've just put this little diagram of the functional areas of the brain on the side. Now, if we think about where we're at here, creating a kind of a conscious AGI or certainly something that looks, walks and talks and seems as conscious as a human, suddenly seems quite possible. Now, ChatGPT4 on its own is it is like one part of the brain. And you can see here we've got, you know, the brain's made up of a whole section of different systems, the frontal lobe, the temporal lobe, parietal lobe, uh, et cetera, et cetera, co covering aspects of vision, perception, control, hearing, language. Now, if you imagine each of these as a kind of a GPT-4 uh, AI, imagine uh, a kind of a memory uh, section, imagine, you know, kind of a vision set section, all of these having inputs and outputs coming together, and then some controlling point, uh, you know, with all of this information coming in and it generating outputs. And suddenly you've got this constant input stream and we've got this constant aggregate generation of what to do next. And it's choosing what systems to go. And it's like a series of, of AIs and GPT-4 based uh, or transformer based models all interacting together in, in this system uh, with some kind of, uh, you know, uh, governing uh, purpose. Uh, that, that was built into it, you know, kind of a limbic system purpose with a cerebral cortex type style, style purpose where it's kind of updating a kind of a, a strategic algorithm of, of what, what it's trying to achieve. You put all of that together. And suddenly, and really for the first time, 
it's possible to conceive exactly how you could create uh, this human like um, AGI model on, on ourselves, this kind of version one. And you know, there's never really been a time before where, where I've thought that you know, this is how it could be done. But suddenly all the ingredients are there to do this. And really, it's just a matter of time before somebody puts all this stuff together and uh you know we're having this this consciousness day debate at, at, at you know new new levels so what are the implications of all of this for higher education well to start with i'd like to consider the concept that i've well, I've come up with really called intellectual output. Now, ChatGPT4 slash AI uh, is supposed to, it's, it's predicted to 4x, four times the output of knowledge workers. So by knowledge workers, we mean, you know, computer programmers, lecturers, um, designers, marketing people, lawyers, accountants, etc., or everyone working in the knowledge industry. What are these people doing in their jobs? Well, they are producing intellectual output of some format. They, intellectual output is the output of knowledge workers. And taking us right back to first principles here, the purpose of higher education is to enhance the intellectual output capability of its students, to enhance slash facilitate the intellectual output of its researchers and to enhance the intellectual output of organizations, society and humanity. So this is what we're trying, we're trying to do. Now, what is intellectual output? Well, essentially, we can think of it as there's some kind of context, some kind of background, uh, some kind of input. So, you know, um, some sort of history that, that's brought us to this this point of, of producing our intellectual output. And then we've got the kind of, you know, the juice, the questions, the framing, the insight, the new information, some research, something that's been done by the by the knowledge worker. And that there could be some analysis going along here. So we've got the context, we've, we've got the, the questions that have been framed, mixed in with some analysis. And then that outputs uh, a kind of a communication of what this is about that could be in different formats. It could be 3000 word essays. It could be presentations. It could be uh, tax returns. You know, it could, 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 could be different styles. And then we've got potential promotion of, of that output. So let's just take an example like a uh, writer. I'm, I'm a bit obsessed with 3000 word essays because they're all, all of my assignments are 3000 word essays at the moment. Let's say we're doing a 3000 word essay uh, on the implications of uh, Brexit on um, UK business. So basically we could start with a literature review, that would be our context. Uh, we could do a, a little bit of, you know, other publications associated with all of that. Uh, we bring all of this lot together, that's our context. Um, the juice, well, this was the framing of the question uh, in the first place. But also within that context, you know, how are we going to thematically analyze it? Where are we going to do what? What's our angle that we're we're bringing to that question? But, you know, where are we coming from? Are we going to look at the implications of you know, Brexit on, on, you know, on the UK, UK business? Are we going to frame that from a kind of a, a worker perspective? Are we going to frame it from a um, a uh, an employer perspective, a, a wealth creation perspective, a quality of life. Um, you know, it could be could be business. It could be you know international international positioning. Uh, it could to be to with rate of progress. All all of these questions and prompts are how we're framing this you know the huge limitless context and bringing it into the into the piece of work that that, that we're creating. Uh, we could be doing some re research. We could be doing some interviews of differing people. Uh, we might be analysing large amounts of data in this analysis section as well. So we've got our juice um, with the prompts. We've got our analysis going on to support that. Then we've got our output, which is you know the, the, 
following that literature review and our questioning framing and analysis, we've then got this communication, the main body of our essay that's going to be laying out uh, what we've come up with, what our points are, uh, what this added value is that we, you know, the juice that we put onto the context. We now got this output format, uh, you know, that, that's there in the essay. Um, we, we're going to be doing that in words with a, you know, with a kind of a, a conclusion that could be some main main themes. There might be some recommendations uh, that, that could be uh, an, an exploration of the, of the arguments. And then finally, we might have some promote promotion we do. We might write a LinkedIn po post to promote this or or so on and so forth. So you can see how all of that that's fit, fit, fitting together. If we're going to do a, a research paper for publication, uh, again, very similar format. We've got our literature review in the context. We've got the questions, the questions that we framed the literature review and where do we point it? What are we trying to do with it? How are we analyzing it? What's our research data that we've pulled in? We've got some analysis tools and then we're going to communicate it within the, the other 6,000 odd words of our, our research publication. Um, and, and then, you know, we need to publish it and promote it, et cetera, et cetera. Now, everything in blue can be done by AI, the large language model AI. And, you know, it can it can be done today with a bit of hard work on the prompting. It can pretty much put all of that together for you. What it can't do, though, is ask the questions. Yeah, it can't frame the debate. It can't work out how to use itself in that area. That's what the user, the knowledge worker is bringing in. It's taking all of this context and information, pointing it at a certain point, asking the right questions, maybe adding in a little bit of extra data that's you know primary from, from itself, using the AI to analyze that and synthesize it. And then once we've got that, the juice worked out, built from the context, built from our extra insight and data, added in with the analysis, we can then communicate that. The AI can generate it, it could generate it in any format. It could be a presentation, it could be an essay, uh, it could be, um, uh, you know, it could be, could be diagrams, it could, could be video. Uh, it can choose the target audience. So is the output going to be for professors? Is it going to be for academics? Is it going to be for, you know, uh, um, blue collar workers? Is it going to be for, for everyday people? Is it going to be for 18 year olds, five year olds, seven, seven year olds? Um, what style of writing is it going to be? Is it going to be factual, engaging, entertaining? So we can filter all of that and just generate our communication aspect you know, automatically. And finally, we can promote it. Having produced the output, we can ask it to engage Gen Z, Gen X. We, we choose, we can choose different social media. We could write video, we could write images, we, we, we could do blogs on it. And really, if you think about what is the Forex knowledge worker? How do we get to this four times productivity? We get to the Forex productivity of our knowledge workers by training them on how to produce really good quality juice and building in our knowledge workers the capabilities to use AI to re assess the context, to analyze you know, uh, the data and, and the information, and to produce the communication format and do the promotion. So it's a combination of using the AI to boost this intellectual output. Four times is, 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 the, project, is, is the projection. Um, and what skills do we need our knowledge workers to have? Well, we need to be great at the juice, the good stuff, the higher level thinking, the strategy, the questions, the prompts, the framing. But we also need them to be great at using the AI, using the AI to do the research, to do the analysis, to generate the communication uh, and to generate the promotion. And really, when you think about that, there's a potential for an explosion here of, of kind of existential exploration of research, knowledge, outputs, productions, because it, it's freeing up uh, the, the, the knowledge worker to just get their ideas out there, get things done. It really enables doing an action and bringing ideas out, publicing, publishing, uh, pushing things forward and, and moving things forward. And if in higher education we want to create these 4X graduates, yeah, we need them 
to be working on this model. We need to design our assessments around producing quality juice in the subject area and using AI to analyze the context, analyze uh, your data, uh, your research data that, that might be there, communicate the outputs in whatever format is chosen and, and, then, and then promote it. So they need the skill set to do that. That's what we should be assessing for. That's what we should be teaching for. That's what we should be helping them learn in that area. We should be looking at our research being framed in this in this area. And then we also need to embed this whole concept into the curriculum because the context, the analysis, the communication all need to be framed now within this new AI landscape world. And, you know, if we think about this, you know, if we've got our typical MBA, shall we say, current MBA does an MBA course. One of the courses we're developing uh, here at Manchester Metropolitan University is, is hopefully going to be the MBAI. Now, this would be an MBA with all of this embedded through through it, this whole me methodology. So all the subjects are taught where the, the student is using AI tools to, to generate context, assess analysis, communication, promotion, but there's really strong focus on the quality and the framing of the questions, the strategic thinking going behind it, what are we doing this information, the juice, the real, real good stuff. And then the student graduates as a, a kind of a Forex MBA, uh, a graduate capable of producing four times uh, um, the, the output. Well, this could apply to really any any course, this, this kind, kind, kind of thinking. So with that in mind, as the kind of first principles implications for higher education, I've produced a, a bit of a, a look at some of the uh, implications for the for the student, and I've had I've considered that in terms of student learning uh, and, and graduate outcomes. I've split into short term, long term. So, just to give an idea, short term we could be using GPT as a personal tu tutor, use ChatGPT to explain difficult concepts in single language. Uh, GPT suggests papers, reference lists. Uh, to assist in essay planning, assignment presentation, uh, identify general themes and trends, broadly research uh, a subject domain. So again, there, you know, looking at this previous slide, really looking at the context, communication, those things are all ready available now. Short term, obviously, the threat, the threat is plagiarism. Uh, it's not always correct. Failure to understand uh, and and you, and, you, and, you, and use it. Uh, and use it use it correct correctly, but I, I really think part of that plagiarism challenge can be the solution. There is in the assessment design. It's looking to assess these areas uh, as opposed to previously we had assessments in some of those blue areas, which which are just ripe for for plagiarism. It's like setting a, a mental arithmetic test. Um, and then getting this, you know, when you know students have got a calculator and getting them to do it at home, it's going to be very difficult to detect uh, what, what, what comes up. Long term, we could have a, a personalised AGI tutor for every student, uh, you know, giving feedback, helping them out. Uh, we could generate personalised programmes and courses that were tailor made to the students' abilities and, and kind of input levels. Uh, all the materials could be changing. We, we could have it explanations in different language uh, based on you know how comfortable you are speaking academic language under undergraduate language you know a level language and so on and so forth threats superficial understanding of code concepts there's ethical and societal claims biases and frames in terms of graduate outcomes uh, we've got improved utility and relevance opportunities for graduates um, we allow graduates to focus on value added knowledge and skills um, threats, doing this badly and reducing student ability to create contents. You know, we, we could just create kind of button pushes if we're not too careful here. But I think the other threat is not doing this fast enough. If, if we don't embed AI into our curriculums quickly, we're letting our students down. Uh, I think this is really important. This is going to be such a key, 
key skill set for for our graduates in in the years to come. And really, uh, us as educators need to you know look at ourselves and say, you know, we need to embed, we need to embed these skills in, in, in them now. You know, and I think we need to do it do it quickly. Um, Longer term, as a business school, we train students that there are there could be AI buddies ready for each industry. You know, each, each graduate could have a, a kind of an AI that goes through their education system with them and they, they, they graduate together. So, you know, you've got like your MBA and your MBA I buddy and you, you graduate together and you're ready to go and do trouble in, in, in industry or you, you're a digital marketing skills student you you train through with your own personalized ai it does the courses sits the exams with you or when you graduate you graduate as a, as a pair as a team ready to go and forex your productivity uh in in the world and the threats associated with things like that, you know, we've got a terminated two risk, you know, who's making the decisions, the AI buddy there. Just some quick things I've 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 put through from the student perspective. From the academics uh, perspective, in terms of implications in the HE, we've got opportunities in the already that use uh, GPT as a personal assistant. Think of it as your personal assistant with an IQ of 80 but near infinite knowledge up to the year 2021 uh, with the ability to you know, produce huge amounts of text and output almost instantaneously. Could be used for session planning, development, marking and assessment support, subject matter research, literature reviews and annotated bibliographies, thematic analysis of large data, completion of conference submission, research grant internal forms and bureaucracy I, I, i've used this to help me produce uh, conference applications i've used it to uh, complete internal forms uh, and various applications it's a fantastic bureaucracy uh, buster uh, you know when you've got the original content yourself you can just upload that and say right i've got to fill in this form i need 500 words on the benefits for students i need 250 words on how this impacts greater manchester and it just fires it out and you know you give it your your context or your cv or or whatever and it can just output these things and fill in the forms generate social media blogs etc really the 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 short term threat i think is is not adapting uh academics who don't adapt to this change are going to find it very hard to keep up because the pace of change, I think, is going to be so fast. Longer term, create a personalised research and teaching system for every academic. We could all have our own little buddy, one that we train to mark how we want to mark, to design plans how we want to design, one that answers students' questions. And we would sort of set up a course, set up a programme. Uh, and with that, we would be working on our own AI that would be you know, able to help and support and and work with that program. But that's superficial understanding key concepts, ethical uh, bias and fairness, et cetera. Wider implications for higher education, curriculum development, research opportunities, marking assessment and feedback, bias and fairness. We could even, I can even conceive an automated personalized university, programs teaching research input. You literally upload your own CV, your social media profile, whatever, so it knows who you are, all of your previous exam results to date, and it just generates a whole university with courses and reading and everything personalised to you, and you choose what course you want to do, and it takes you on your own personalised learning journey in a format that's educationally the most effective to you building up the skills uh, designing courses to for you to learn and be taught how you want and you, you can you, you can see this being something of 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 the future so uh, hopefully not too soon uh, because it'd be nice to uh, at least not have our jobs completely disrupted uh, for at least a few years uh, see if we can make it to uh, Skynet in 2028 as per Ray Kurzweil's prediction. So wider implications for business and society. 
This graph is showing the aggregate capability of AI systems. So if we have a little think about this in terms of, you know, by capability, we're, we're talking kind of, you know, billions of, of training sets. And you can see, you know, here we are, it's set 2022 as a, an issue, uh, as a point. And we're talking about 2023 being 10 times more capable. We're talking about 2027 being 10,000 pounds, 10,000 times more capable than the current uh, AI system, the AI cap aggregate capability of the world at the moment. So phenomenal uh, rate, rates of, of, of increase. Um, it's difficult to conceive what the world will be like. In fact, Sam Altman is is uh, quoted as quoting uh, some somebody else um, uh, whose whose name eludes me, but but he he said, if you think you understand the implications of of AI, then you do not understand the implications of of AI, uh, which I think was quite an interesting point. Now, AI training costs are plummeting. Uh, back in 2020, uh, it cost $4.6 million to train a, a GPT-3 level performance. 2022, this had come down to $450,000. And the projection by uh, ARK Invest, these figures are coming from, is that this will fall to $30 by 2030, which is literally the, the toaster from Red Dwarf suddenly having you know artificial general intelligence in, built into it can can recite the works of shakespeare uh etc cetera, etc cetera. and uh, you know again difficult to conceive and what we're talking about here as well is the base model so chat gpt is just one large language model that has been trained from a data set so you know imagine a future where you can train your own models with choose from a suite of training data, put in different motives and things, et cetera, and you, you can complete a complete personalized base model, as opposed to what we're doing with prompting, which is fine tuning the GPT model. So truly incredible what's there. AI should increase knowledge worker productivity dramatically. So the world economy, $100 trillion today, uh, ARK Invest are projecting a $200 trillion productivity GDP boost by 2030. Uh, so an additional 200 trillion um, at a cost of 41 trillion. Uh, but so a net 160 trillion uh, GDP boost um, to uh, you know the the world's output as a result of AI, so huge productivity gains uh, to be achieved there. All coming really from this four x knowledge worker output. There's going to be massive disruption in all jobs and sectors. I think Goldman Sachs Goldman Sachs just published a report talking about uh, 300 million uh, jobs uh, being lost uh, in knowledge based industries. Um, and huge amounts of jobs created. So it's going to be a huge productivity boost. But if you think about it, the world has a massive debt problem at the moment um, following COVID. Uh, the debt levels in the US, the debt levels in most of the developed nations, ph phenomenal. We've also got a declining uh, working age population. So there's, we've got this massive issue with declining working age population, huge amount of debt, increasing amount of, uh, of older people. And then we're going to you know, roll on 20 years. We've got a tiny number of people who need to produce enough to uh, service all this debt and you know, keep all of these old, older people, look after all these older people in their health care and their, their social and wealth welfare needs. And how are they going to do that? Well, the good news is AI. AI is how they're going to do it. Um, the solution is sat there for governments and the world to, to do. 
Uh, perhaps the challenge here for the world and, and for wider society is going to be making sure it benefits everybody. And uh, this power and this wealth does not leave large sections of the world out uh, struggling in isolation with no money, no wealth. Um, it's going to be very challenging. There's there's a lot to get involved with here and, and really so many aspects of research, uh, you know, especially when we look at things like sustainable development, sustainability, sustainable, all of this stuff needs to be um, rewritten, really. Take, well, not rewritten, developed to encompass the new AI uh, derived world and these huge transitions and and, and what, what and what's going going on to I think we've got a lot of questions as well we need to ask ourselves about intellectual property who owns the AIs uh, what about the information that generates from them can people harness them and leverage them you know should should they be nationalized uh, there's whole sorts of uh, you know should countries have an AI working for for all the people of the country uh, should there be a global one? Who knows? Really more questions than answers. Uh, but for sure, you know, it's coming and there is going to be a phenomenal productivity boost. And no country is going to be able to ignore this uh, because with globalization, the, the, the pro rate progress is, is, is just too, too great. And AI sits in the center very much of these you know, blockchains, multi-omic sequencing, energy storage, robotics, really driving these uh, converging uh, platforms and pushing things together. What next for MMU Business School? In light of all of this, this changing world, what, what next? Well, coming up, we have the chat GPT challenge, which is going to take place on the 20th of May uh, between 9 and 6 p.m. We've got the full ground floor of the business school booked out. It's open to all staff, academics, students, higher educate, other higher education institutions, uh, greater Manchester professionals, businesses. Uh, confirmed, we've got Microsoft uh, talking about coming along. Novo AI have agreed to run an online uh, version of the challenge. They're a um, tech startup in AI that I demonstrated before. AI Buddy are going to be uh, spon uh, sponsoring the event. We've got the Federation of Small Businesses. They're interested in getting involved. I've got meetings with the Growth Hub, Zapier, uh, many more. Waitman's uh, LLP have just agreed to be the uh, the main uh, legal sponsor of the event. Uh, we've got Radio 5 interested in coming and many more. And really, I've actually, following feedback from you know the live presentation of this, this session uh, and discussions with colleagues afterwards, thinking really of actually expanding this event. We've got, we've got the whole business school uh, to go through to make it uh, a, a chat GPT slash AI Greater Manchester Conference and really invite you know, other members of staff to put on events, presentations uh, during the day and perhaps other organisations and really make it a real kind of AI focal conference uh, with all kinds of events that could be workshops, that could be interviews, that could, that, that, that could, be, could be talks. Um, uh, and really, I'd like to invite other people, other members of staff, if you'd like to put on an event uh, as part of the the AI conference on that day, um, please get in touch with me, and you know, and, and we we can we can get things sorted out. So we've we've got a hundred and um, it's actually one hundred and forty five pre registered now. Uh, I've I've got a whole series of things we're doing to promote it. Um, you know, but get involved. Uh, get involved. What do we mean by all of that? Well, in the in the smallest point, just for for for, for individuals, experiment. You know, just log on to ChatGPT, have a go on that Nova AI. That's free. Just use it. Start prompting it. See what it comes up. Learn about it. Explore about it. 
get a sense of what generative AI is. I think that's that, that's a real key learning concept there. Um, explore its implications in your field, having got a feeling of what it can do. What does this mean in your area of research, in your area of, area of teaching? And obviously, come, come to the chat, beat child challenge, get, get along with the events. Um, for the university as a whole, uh, it would be great to run a, a chat GPT challenge slash, you know, AI uh, in education conference at, at the end of, of every term. I think there's going to be a continuous change program here over the next five, 10 years and having a regular conference uh, to keep us at the, the forefront of, of this kind of adoption is, is something that's very exciting. Uh, monthly departmental meeting AI corners. We could have a, an AI lead uh, for each department within the university. Uh, and at the, at the departmental meetings, the AI lead could just pull together what's going on in terms of learning, teaching, assessment, curriculum, research and ethics in that department. And perhaps these leads could, could, could get together uh, um, uh, every so often across the departments just to share knowledge and progress. Um, we've got a, a new programme uh, that, that would be fantastic to get launched, uh, the MBA I, which is basically a normal MBA programme. I talked about it before with um, AI horizontally embedded through, throughout the, the whole um, programme. So the students would be uh, you're doing this programme with an AI. They would be learning with it. All the teaching would be AI enhanced. They would have AIs to help them. And they're critically, their assessments would be produced using uh, AIs. It will all be back to that intellectual um, output diagram, really focusing on the juice and then using the AI for the context, the analysis, the communication uh, and the promotion aspects. Um, pulling together these you know, AI leadership in, in the university from the different teams connecting in, you know, we need to incorporate into our, we've just launched a fantastic education strategy and really, um, AI is kind of a, a catalyst to to everything that, that, that we've got in there. And how does it fit in? What does it do? We, we need to sort of assimilate that and and and, and create the, the, the kind of high level uh, vision for, for, for the organization. And finally, really, it's a, it's a kind of a culture change to organizational uh, learning. We need to, the university is perhaps, uh, you know, in institutional inertia com comes to mind. We're not always the quickest to, to adapt. Well, unfortunately, the, the operating environment out there is accelerating away at a, an incredible rate. And we need to transform our organisation to one that is going to keep up. Uh, and to do that, we need a culture of organisational learning. We need to be experimenting, playing, trying new things out, learning by doing. Lots of the information uh, that are pulled together for this, there are no research papers published. This stuff isn't available. You can't read it. You can't find it in textbooks because it's only a few months old. It's happening really fast. And this information is coming from uh, having a go with the apps, having a go with the prompting, trying different thing, things out. It's coming from Twitter. It's coming from 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 uh, uh, TikTok. Uh, it's coming from U YouTube videos and blogs. It's coming from self-published uh, papers that, that researchers are publishing. There's, a, there's an Arvix uh, place that all, all the AI people seem to pub publish their things on. And it is casting a kind of a, a critical um, academic eye over that type of material and synergizing it in with the established uh, established re re research. But it's kind of you know learning by doing mixed in with uh, you know what 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 we kind of what what we were traditionally been uh, doing with with literature reviews. But so creating this culture of organizational learning, experimenting, trying, probing, new things, etc. Um, couple of couple of policy ideas that that would, would be good from an IT policy point of view. I think it's too slow. I don't think we can wait for us to create university-wide 
agreed software that we're going to use on this and gather all the licenses. There are literally thousands of new tools all over the place in everybody's subject area available now. And we need academics to be trying these tools, experimenting these tools, using with these tools, and incorporating them into their research, their learning and their teaching now. Our students are doing it. It's imperative that, that we're doing it in order to keep up and, 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 and lead here. How can we quickly do that? Well, what about if every every academic had a £100 payment limit uh, prepayment credit card that we could only use for subscribing to uh, AI slash academic related software uh, packages? So like the $20 a month for GPT-3 or you know the, the, the $3 a month for um, uh, connected papers or quite a lot of them are free but some of them cost a little bit more and you know you can apply for this and you know just academics can just subscribe to things have a go cancelling it maximum limit of a hundred dollars a month uh could even be fifty dollars a month uh, but it just lets people do it have a go try something out cancelling it and it just cuts all the bureaucracy and really speeds it up and it encourages that learning and organizational approach with these these new te technologies in a kind of bureaucracy busting uh, way. A second idea could be uh, a slight change to workload model applications. So we could have a retrospective workload model applications. The idea here is that, you know, if you're going to organize something uh, like a, an AI event or put, put something on, uh, Basically, you just do it and do all the extra work and you work a workload model to 1.2 and you have a, a surge, a bit of a sprint. Uh, the thing is, we can't keep working at that 1.2 level indefinitely because we'd burn out. But what we can do is work at that 1.2 level for a couple of months. Achieve something and then have an output, you know, a successful conference or, or, or whatever, and then retrospectively apply for point two, let's say, back out of the workload model in the future. And, you know, the evidence of the submission would be the, the output, the, the, the successful outcome of, of the event. The application would go in. And, and if, if so, they would say, yes, this was worth a point two. Uh, and then you could have, you know, run like a, a term, let's say, as a, as a point eight. Uh, and then you can get this little feeling of little sprints as new things come along and people can move quickly even though they're not workload allocated for it. And then based on the achievements they could they could capture, they could then recover afterwards and have a slightly lower workload to make up for that extra work. It's just one idea of how we get away from writing X thousand word essays to get time to do some research into something, because this is moving so fast. How do we create a system where academics can just push and delve into things now, and the workload model can catch up later. That one's a couple of ideas there out, out, out for thought, out for thought. And finally, a bit of a bit of a call to action, really. Um, I mean, as we as we we're standing here really on on an era, the dawn of a new era in higher education, and I would urge everybody watching this to seize this unparalleled opportunity that that's lying before us at this moment this is not just a fleeting moment it's a once in a generation chance to catapult your career our institution our global impact uh to to new heights you know by embracing the limitless potential of this groundbreaking innovation we, we can redefine the very essence of higher education, creating a future that is more inclusive, accessible and engaging for learners around the world. You know, so let, let's all come together here. Let's forge a new path, harnessing the power of AI to reshape the educational landscape for the betterment. Now's the time to act. You know, let's really embrace this challenge, push the boundaries of what's possible. And you know, we can we can redefine the future of higher education. Okay, thank you all very much for listening.
if, if anyone else has is interested uh, within within the university uh, or, or indeed out there of getting involved in AI, promoting AI, or really getting involved with the the uh, event on the on the twentieth, um, please do get in touch. Thank you.